as I say this, I say this to an empty sanctuary. My company, rows of empty pews. But as I say that, I also know many people are wondering, where is the good? For a short while now, we have been confronted with a reality that we actually do live in a broken world. And this brokenness has come too close to home. Brokenness is not new. We, we are not unaware of brokenness, but usually brokenness is out there or over there. And now we feel like the victims of brokenness. Discomfort we usually watch on the evening news or hear on our radios or uh, through our phones uh, has suddenly moved in next door. And we are unhappy. We're uncomfortable, maybe even afraid. I suppose the easy thing for me to do would be to share a few verses, tell you, don't be afraid, and God's got it all in hand. Now, that's not a bad thing, and those things are true, but there might be another thing we need to think about today. But first, let me share with you a few of those verses that I might share with you. In Joshua 1.9, we read, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Isaiah 53, or 35, 4, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, and he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Isaiah said, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Matthew, Jesus Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus also said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. These are all very nice words. They're more than nice words. These are words toward a fuller life. And we appreciate the encouragement Do not be afraid. Now these words are from the Bible. They're God's words, and so they're powerful words, life-changing words. But at the end of the day, they're words. So instead of simply quoting more scriptures and offering well-meant platitudes, I'd like to remind you of what I know you already know, or rather remind you of who you know. I'd like you to listen to a familiar passage A passage known by many, many even outside of the realms of the church. And then I want to make a few comments on those verses. Psalm 23, all six verses. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Familiar words, meaningful words, and so appropriate for today. David wrote, capturing his understanding of the God who held him safely in his hands. And these images were a real comfort for one like David, not without reason for fear, alone in the wild while he watched his sheep, alone while facing a menacing heathen giant, alone against friends who had become his enemies, alone as a leader, alone in his sin. He understood alone. Now, I don't know about you, but I can relate. I have been the small one. I have been alone. I have faced enemies. Even friends become unfriendly. And I can imagine. I've seen enough to know some of the things our current situation could do to me. You also probably have been thinking. Now, David wrote, without having met the good shepherd we know as Jesus, These are his words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, Jesus, we know this, but Jesus has our best in mind. He really does. And that's what a shepherd provides, the very best for his sheep. Sheep under this kind of care never lack for what they need. The shepherd provides rest. It's hard work chasing the things we need. It's hard work lugging these bodies around. And some days, it's hard work just being alive. The shepherd provides food, not the unhealthy uh, thistles and thorns and other things a sheep might eat. The shepherd provides green grass, the best diet for his hungry sheep. And the shepherd provides water. And this is so important, not just any water. He leads his sheep to quiet or gentle waters. There's two things about sheep and water we need to know. First, sheep spook easily, and so rushing, moving water would spook a sheep. But still water might be tainted water. Sheep need clean water. That, that would be moving water, but it needs to be moving at the right speed or pace. And the good shepherd would lead his sheep to clean and calm moving waters. The shepherd calms his sheep's heart. Though they're easily spooked and often quivering with fear, the shepherd would draw them near, even carry them. The sheep that was overwhelmed by life, once calm, though, back into the fold. And that next line, to me at least, reads as a commentary. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This line captures what the shepherd does for his flock of sheep and what God does for you and for me. Our shepherd meets our every need, and he does so with tender attention. He knows us full well. And our shepherd guides us along the best course. He feeds us and he provides drink, his word, his spirit. We are not left to fend for ourselves. He sets these good things right in front of us. And our shepherd also nudges us when we wander, when we get too far from what is safe. We know from other Bible passages that our shepherd would leave the 99 just to find the one that had wandered. Now maybe you can only see sheep, but I can easily see myself in this passage. And, like, and I like what I see. I see two big things. First, I see a pretty clear picture of me. Not always paying attention. Not always where I should be. Not always taking care of myself. But I also see a second reality. Another clear picture, a picture of Jesus always attending to me, always providing what I need, always protecting me, especially when I'm in over my head or outside of my comfort zone. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. These words are powerful words. Speaking into our lives as death stalks us, reminding us that we are not alone, that we have a tour guide around or toward death. And he fully understands Jesus has already been there. These words are powerful words, speaking to, to our lives when death strikes, reminding us that we have one who has been there in his back and now waits for us to journey with him to join him. Might we suffer? Might we suffer in this way during this awkward time we're in now? Maybe, probably not. But we don't have to surrender to fear. Jesus is already aware. Jesus is faithfully with us. Jesus assures that we are safe, never out of his care. Now I suppose we need to finish the psalm for the rest of the picture of this shepherd. Verse five. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, and surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't see this as a promise that nothing will harm us, but I do see God, I see Jesus, allowing me to dance with him before the things 
people or powers or even experiences that otherwise might make my knees shake. Do I want to die? Not right now. Not most days. Do I want to get sick? Not right now. And almost never. These are things I'm not aspiring to, but I'm aware of the realities that could enter my life. But in any case, Jesus says he has my back and my front and both sides. No matter how I measure what I see, he is bigger than that. He is more powerful than that. And he is informed on what is best for me. And he knows what's best for you. We are under the care of a shepherd who promises a good end to our story. And he walks with us through every situation that comes our way, the good, the bad, and the ugly, even the ones we might find to be painful, even the ones that we would prefer not to have in our lives. Will we hurt? Yeah, sometimes. There will be hard days, and we will have to deal with pain, ours or others, or corporately. Will we get sick? At some point. Most of us get colds and sickness and our doctors and our hospitals are kept busy because we get sick. Will we die? Probably. Unless he returns first. Death is part of life. Death is part of living and when we own that, the living is easier. Will we be alone? With reason to fear? No. Never. Not for a moment. Jesus doesn't take vacation. Jesus doesn't look the other way. Doesn't take naps. He's our 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, every moment, every second shepherd. Now there is a time though when we might be alone. It's in those moments in our minds and our hearts where we feel alone because we have chosen to look away from him, to do something other, to attend to things that have nothing to do with him. It's just about us. When we try to do daily life on our own, we find ourselves alone. We're not, but our reality is, I feel alone. Now I wonder, in all of this, in all of this wondering about our circumstances today, in wondering about how our shepherd cares for us, could it be, could it be that these hard kinds of moments, like right now, flavor our lives once in a while, just so that we're reminded that we need a shepherd? Allow me to land this message this morning with a theologically mature rendition of the sentiment we find in this psalm. Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, he wrote these following words in chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, and we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. I like that God knows how to finish my prayers. He knows what I would say if I knew how to say it. It's kind of where I am today. I just don't know how to pray for everything that I need to pray for. And perhaps you share that with me. Verse 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And he gives us good things. Verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that. 
who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. I love this next section. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present, the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In true Pauline fashion, theologically sound, Paul reminds us of the one who holds our lives in his hands. And he reminds us how big and how sure are the hands that hold each one of us. Am I afraid? Not right now, but I admit I've had my moments and I'm going to have a lot more of them. I expect other things to arise that just shake me. What is my goal? It's a goal that we both should be sharing, you and me. Our eyes on the shepherd, our ears tuned toward his voice. If I can hear him, if we can hear him, maybe even see his words and his work, I know, you can know, not hope, that we are okay. So I ask you this morning, what about you? Are you okay right now? Are you okay this morning? In spite of everything that's going on, are you okay? If not, I invite you to allow your heart to wander over toward Jesus, the shepherd. Allow your eyes to roam over his precious word, the Bible, so that you can hear his voice speaking through those words into your life. And talk with him. He is waiting to talk with you. He loves your voice. Tell him how you're feeling. Tell him what your concerns are. And he'll allow his spirit to wrap himself around you, around your heart. And to give you a measure of comfort that you're going to know came from him because it's bigger than what you're capable of producing on your own. That's my experience. And I'm experiencing it right now. He's ready to embrace you. Pray with me, please. Jesus, shepherd, caretaker of our tender lives and souls. We have reason, we think, to be fearful. But your word tells us otherwise. You hold us safe in your hands. These circumstances are not beyond you. They're not bigger than you. But you're allowing us to go through them. Perhaps there are lessons we're going to get to learn. Perhaps there's uh, opportunities for us to yet serve one another. Perhaps there's attention to our responsibility as your salt and life in this community. Strengthen us. Give us a boldness to do daily life the way you would if you were here. Help us submit to our authorities and to the medical experts so that we will curtail certain things, so that we don't endanger ourselves or others. But help us be true to you and to each other as we chase after the grace and mercy and love that so encompass our lives. Bless us, Father, we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>